The Holy Gospel is written in the ninth chapter. The Gospel according to Mark, beginning at the 30th verse. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. They went out on from there and passed through Galilee. Jesus did not want anyone to know it. For he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, the Son of Man must be betrayed into human hands and they will kill him. And three days after being killed, he will rise again. They did not understand what he was saying and they were afraid to ask him. When they come to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, what were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent. From the way they had argued with one another, who was the greatest? He sat down, called the 12 and said to them, whoever wants to be first must be the last of all and the servant of all. <clears throat> then he took a little child and put it among them. And taking it in his arms, he said to them, whoever welcomes one such child, <coughs> <coughs> whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes we, me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. This is the gospel of the Lord. Lord Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, let me bring the team back in. Welcome back, Doug. Welcome back, Andrew. Okay, look, I, I, as I said in the newsletter, I think it's almost comical that um, with Jesus talking about his, his coming suffering and death, that the disciples there are arguing about who is the greatest, you know. At the same time, th this is the history of the church. We've, we're always <laughs> trying to push to be the greatest. The lust for power never seems to dissipate. It's a, it's a tragic uh, reality that the church has been a subject to power play and the lust for power as any human institution. And, you know, perhaps that's the warning that's here. Um, it's talking, it's showing us for who we really are, you know, in our human nature, we are always going to try and lust for power and elevate our own selves and our selfish ambition above the service of others, above devoting ourselves to a higher cause, above loving our neighbours and our family above uh, more than ourselves. Um, this is the same as, you know, what the, what it talks about in the proverb about the good wife. I mean, she can't be a good wife if she's all about herself. You know, our service, our, our, our true self, when we, um, what, that, as recognised by, you know, with what God has given us is about serving others and, you know, serving our families, loving our husbands and wives loving others it's 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 about building something outside of ourselves not us not you know just building and getting all for ourselves. Well, well said brother it's, well said. yeah it's, I mean, it's, a, it's a beautiful tie-in between all those three passages for sure yeah. mm. and and very rare today as as we as we often saw because i mean i, I was just you know, as you know, I'm just recently married, and I just feel so blessed by the by the beautiful wife that I've found. And you know, you just look around these days, and you think, "Geez, that kind of woman is hard to find." So, you know, but the other thing is, you know, the Bible teaches clearly that that it's the it's the woman's job to teach the daughter how to become a woman like that, right? It's the mother's daughter how to. Uh, mother's job to teach the daughter how to how to love and how to be a woman that that would be uh described and, and can live up to those sorts of principles as described in proverbs it's um it's it's not easy but that's that's what um you know is the job of family well, that's my thoughts I, when i read <laughs> <laughs> when I when I read that uh, passage, 
I'm constantly thinking about ecclesiology, would you believe? Because um, uh, um, uh, I see the Catholics and the Anglicans and the Orthodox talking about their uh, apostolic succession. I, I, I equate that directly that to the sons of thunder asking for who is at the right hand of God, you know, and it, yeah. it just it's a it just seems exactly matched to me. Who is the greatest? Who is the greatest? We've got the apostolic church, not you. You're, we're part of the main church, not you. Yeah, you know, I just hear that all the time, and I, it's just I, it's just against, in my view, the spirit of Christ. Yeah, and it, no, it's just like Father totally Dave with, says okay. with with the tribalism all the time it's it's that it's it's whether we do it on a personal level or on a group level it's 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 these structures and these perspectives or frameworks that we set up in our mind of us against them sort of thing which is which is toxic and, and destroys our lives mm. the only the city i think it's the job of family and love and relationship between them that the parents absolutely true so absolutely so. Yeah. I, I i just want to want to comment a bit more on this whole thing of the lust for power the lust for power you would have thought jesus would help us get over it by now and yet it's, <laughs> it's been the reality of the church i'm thinking how many 500 years later saint augustine the church is a whore and she is my mother <laughs> i mean whether he really said that i'm not 100 percent sure but it's been attributed to him uh the lust for power within the church damages people <clears throat> And uh, I'm conscious I'm here amongst uh, two men at least and myself. There's a lot of, we've experienced a lot of damage from the church. Um, my father, my mother were both damaged by the church. I've been damaged by the church. My friend Shorty here on my left, my friend Rob on the right, both all of their own ways have experienced damage from the church. Why? And again, it, I think it's in the end it comes back to this power, um, a lust for power that corrupts, as Lord Acton said. All power tends to corrupt, and absolute power tends to corrupt absolutely. And the church has shown itself, I think, to be corrupted by power over and over again. In some ways, I think the church is worse than secular institutions, you know, that um, maybe because we're not set up for power i don't i don't know i don't know well i think it's What's it's absolutely mean? terrifying when an individual who's char charismatic and has been put in a position of power chooses to do the wrong thing and then you have groups who just blindly follow what that individual is putting down or is saying that they need to do you know that that's the problem like coming back to our original like thought on the two philosophical, you know, uh, topics that you explained to us. It's like, yeah, the individual and, and has, it, it's, I think it's very important for the individual to have liberty, but if, if we're not using our liberty to do the right thing and you find yourself in a position of power where you're either forcing those decisions on the masses or the masses just don't care and they just blindly follow, we have, you know, we have complete societal breakdown at that point, right? Going in such a horrible direction that we see. So uh, obviously they both work together. Um, there is the philosophy. Yeah. There is no like one individual philosophical side that, you know, just works by itself. The power comes from the uh, masses. It, well, it, it's interesting when we talk about power, there's, there's really two sorts of power. There, there's institutional power and there's charismatic power. So institutional power is power from the top down. The power that, who was it, Goering or someone said power that comes through the barrel of a gun? Mm. That sort of institutional yeah. power. The other power is charismatic power, power that's given to you that comes from the bottom up. Mm. So Jesus had charismatic power mm. because he had the support of the people. Herod, Pilate, these sort of people had institutional power. Uh, the reality, of course, is it's only charismatic power that lasts because uh, power that comes through the barrel of the gun, as soon as the gun goes away, the power disappears. Yeah. So, Unfortunately, yeah. without a without a guidepost, right, um, like is provided to us it, throughout the Bible, like that charismatic power can be extremely dangerous too, right? It's like, it's like the most dangerous. 
because it lasts. Totally, totally, totally with you. Yeah. I mean, Hitler had charismatic power as well as institutional power. Yeah. It was just when the charismatic power faded, the institutional power kept the destruction happening. Yeah. Yeah. So, yes, they can work disastrously together. But you think of Jim Jones and the, that mass suicide years ago and things like that. That's all charismatic power at its worst. And so, yeah. Well, we see charismatic power in 1 Corinthians. I follow Paul, you follow Barnabas, I follow Apollos. And yet you see Paul trying to disavow that sort of charismatic power, yeah. doesn't he? Hmm. Uh, very, very strongly. We follow Christ. Christ is the only power. And maybe Christ is the only one who's not corrupted by power. Oh, I wouldn't be corrupted by power. No. <laughs> <laughs> was, yeah, a friend of mine posted recently on Facebook that, yeah, I mean, but going back to what you said, Father Dave, about the, the influence that the church has had on that and just the, the problem with having one person at the top, you know, um, who has that power and doesn't have any checks or balances on him. And, and it, you know, it, it would be better to see church models where that power is distributed amongst, you know, a, a, a larger handful of people. And, you know, so there's there's more um, accountability and, you know, no one person who has all the power calling the shots. But church structure isn't set up like that, is it? It's <laughs> it's I think it's fascinating you say that, Andrew, because I think if you look at the history of the church, you see good godly people attempting to restructure things to achieve exactly what you're saying. Yeah. So as against the system where the Pope or the Bishop or whatever runs everything, we've tried to bring mm -hmm. it down onto a congregational level, as with yeah. congregational churches and well, Presbyterians. And, well, what often happens is you get a different form of tyranny happening at a local level. <laughs> <laughs> you're at a family level, uh, Hazel saying. Yeah, even in our family, we have some people saying my church is better than yours. My church, church is better than yours at a family level. But the, the reality is that, that the lust for power doesn't go away. It just gets <laughs> the locust moves. But I right. mean, maybe all less right. destruction could be done when this it's is, happening at a local level. This all just seems. This all just seems like a waste of time. Like, how are we going to fix this? <laughs> like, I know, I know, obviously, the answer is trying to be, follow and be more like Jesus, right? But, man, he, he just needs to come. I, I, think you're, I think you're spot on, Doug. The reality is there is no way of fixing us. No. Well. What would Paul say at this point? Thanks be to God for our Lord Jesus Christ, you know, yeah. <laughs> that we need to look for redemption from above, ultimately, that there is no way for us self-curing the human condition well, the point, is as it is it's not gonna, but the point we is we need to check, check our yes. we need to check our hearts yes. and we need to check our hearts if you've got a good heart then you can you can be in a position of power and and guide in a in a, and guide uh, you know this the community the the structure that you're in charge of in in the right direction to build something because you're not based on selfish ambition you're trying to do something for the good of others you know that's all that's ever created anything good in this world is people who want to build something that will outlast themselves that that that, that they're building for others they're building for communities they're building for their family yes. they're not focused on themselves so it's it's the same for same with this discussion about power yes we'll always have people who lust after that so you know, we need we need people with good hearts in positions of power. And yes, there's always that temptation for corruption, and so that we need checks and balances as well. But it always just comes down to what is the quality of your heart. Oh, I'm totally with you. But it's not just about wanting to be build something bigger than yourself. That's what they were trying to do at the Tower of Babel, <laughs> uh, sure. and and that's yeah. that's what Adolf Hitler was trying to do. He was trying to build something bigger than himself build something for the entire Aryan race. Didn't make it any better. It was still toxic. Well, I think, so, yeah. I think James, James is pretty spot on, right? When we look at it from an individual standpoint, we, 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 can't, we can't resist the devil without submission to Christ, right? And that's, as Andrew is saying, that's through self-reflection and personal accountability. Right. Totally right. I mean, submission to Christ has is, is got to be the starting point. And the end point. 
Super easy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, in a sense, maybe the gospel reading today should give us some encouragement. For there's some a group of guys who've been spending years at Jesus' side. Yeah. And here they are arguing about who is the greatest. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, the, the penny hasn't dropped, has it? Well, and, um, and, it, and it wasn't until even, talk about spending years at his side, it wasn't any, until after his resurrection that his own brother even <laughs> thought of him as, you know, the Christ, <laughs> as the Messiah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and, and then you, you got 500, 500 years later, St. Augustine saying what he says about the church. She's a whore, but she's my mother. You know that. In other words, the lust of power didn't go away. It was part of the reality between Jesus and his disciples. He tried to teach them. He brings the child in their midst. He tells them. His words endure. And we continue to hear them as we continue to struggle with exactly the same problems. Even the second century, you hear lots of lusts of power, I saw anyway. When yeah, he, he wanted everyone to agree with him. <laughs> if you're not yeah. part of my church, then get out. Stop yeah. calling these other Christians. That's what he said. This is the second century. Oh. A bit of a dismal you a big note drive, to don't you? Don't you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We probably should let you go. No, uh, I thought yeah. maybe, maybe a positive way of looking at this is to recognise that. The problem doesn't go away, but neither does Jesus. Mm. Uh, I so, like it. Yeah. I like it. There, really... there, you know, we've got it there in the gospel. The problems of the last of power have been there from the beginning between him and his disciples after the crucifixion and resurrection. The problems are still there 500 years later, 2,000 years later. We're still dealing with the same crap. <laughs> So still crap. lusting for power, <laughs> which, which is, and Jesus is still here, and we yeah. continue to um, to uh, listen to him and to rely hey. on him. To uh, yeah, I'm just glad that the Sunday Eucharist with Father Dave is the best out there. Nothing compares. <laughs> <laughs> God bless you, brother. 